Right now, millions of people are losing weight. But here's the shocking truth. Almost nobody, including most doctors and fitness trainers, actually knows where that lost fat physically goes. You might think it gets burned as energy or leaves through sweat. But the real answer is so surprising that when researchers surveyed medical professionals, nutritionists and personal trainers, less than 3% got it right. Stick around because I'm about to reveal the mind-blowing science that shows exactly how fat leaves your body. And trust me, you'll never think about weight loss the same way again. It's not like it just melts away into thin air, although that would be convenient. It doesn't magically turn into muscle, no matter how many bicep curls you do. So what's the deal? Today, we're pulling back the curtain on the incredible journey of fat. We're going to demystify this whole process, maybe even have a little fun with it. Think of it as a microscopic adventure from your love handles to, well, we'll get there. We're tracing the path of fat from its cozy storage spots to its ultimate exit from your body. Get ready for the great fat disappearing act. First up, let's meet the stars of our show. The two main types of fat chilling in your body. Not all fat is created equal, at least in terms of where it hangs out and what it does. You've got subcutaneous fat. This is the stuff you can pinch. It lives just under your skin. Subcutaneous fat is mostly a cosmetic concern for many. It's the layer that might hide those hard-earned muscles you're building. Then there's visceral fat. This one is a bit more sneaky and a lot more serious. Visceral fat wraps around your internal organs. We're talking your heart, liver, kidneys, intestines, the vital stuff. While you can't see visceral fat from the outside, it's a major player in health risks. High levels are linked to metabolic syndrome, type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular problems. It's the fat you really want to get rid of for health reasons. Here's the good news though. When you start losing fat, both subcutaneous and visceral fat are fair game. They both respond to the same fat loss mechanisms we're about to discuss. Okay, so you've decided to lose fat. You hit the gym, go for a run, or maybe just dance around your living room like nobody's watching. What happens inside? Exercise, or any activity that creates an energy demand, sends a signal to your body. It's like shouting, hey, we need fuel and we need it now. Your body then starts mobilizing fat from various locations. It doesn't just grab fat from right next to the muscles you're working. It's a systemic call for energy. Let's zoom in to the microscopic level. Fat is stored inside fat cells called adipocytes. Inside these cells, fat is packed away as triglycerides. Think of triglycerides as little energy packages. Each one is made up of a glycerol molecule and three fatty acids. These are the building blocks your body wants to use for fuel. To get to those building blocks, your body needs a special enzyme. Enter hormone sensitive lipase, or HSL for short. HSL is the key that unlocks the triglyceride package. HSL gets activated by certain hormones that surge during exercise or when you're in a calorie deficit. Hormones like epinephrine, norepinephrine and cortisol are the messengers that tell HSL to get to work. This process of breaking down triglycerides into glycerol and fatty acids is called lipolysis. It's the first step in getting fat out of storage. Once the triglycerides are broken down, the fatty acids are released from the fat cells. They spill out into your bloodstream, ready for transport. Now, fatty acids don't mix well with water and your blood is mostly water, so they need a ride. A protein called albumin acts like a taxi service, binding to the fatty acids and transporting them safely through the bloodstream to where they're needed. So, the fatty acids are cruising through your blood, courtesy of albumin. Where are they headed? To the tissues that are demanding energy, like your working muscles. 
Once they arrive at the destination tissue, the fatty acids are transported into the cells. Their ultimate destination within the cell is the mitochondria. Mitochondria are often called the powerhouses of the cell. This is where the magic happens, where fuel is converted into usable energy for your body. Burning fatty acids for energy inside the mitochondria requires oxygen. This is why fat metabolism is considered an aerobic process. You need to be breathing. Let's compare fat to another common fuel source, glucose. Glucose is your body's quick energy go-to, stored as glycogen. When glucose is broken down with oxygen, it yields a decent amount of cellular energy, measured in ATP. We're talking around 32 to 36 ATP molecules per glucose molecule. Now look at fat. A single fatty acid molecule like palmitic acid can yield around 129 ATP molecules. That's a massive difference. This is why fat is such an efficient energy storage molecule. It provides a significantly higher energy yield per molecule compared to glucose. It's dense, long-lasting fuel. Because fat mobilization and metabolism are a bit more complex than tapping into quick glucose stores. They take a little time to ramp up. It's like warming up an engine. You might notice this when you start exercising. For the first 10, 20 minutes, your body relies more on readily available glucose, glycogen. After that, it starts tapping more into fat stores as the fat metabolism engine gets going. Glucose, stored as glycogen in your muscles and liver, provides that quick, readily available energy needed for the initial burst of activity or high intensity efforts. Fat is for the long haul. Okay, so you've mobilized fat, transported it and burned it for energy in your mitochondria. What's the result? When you consistently mobilize and metabolize more fat than you store, your adipocytes, those fat cells, start to shrink. They don't disappear. They just get smaller. Imagine your fat tissue like a balloon. When you lose fat, the air is let out and the balloon gets smaller and deflates. This shrinking of fat cells leads to a thinning of your adipose tissue layer. The overall volume of fat decreases. As the layer of subcutaneous fat thins out, visible changes start to occur. Those underlying muscles you've been working on become more apparent. Definition starts to show. If you're losing visceral fat, the benefits are even more profound for your health. Reducing the fat around your organs decreases the compression on them. This reduction in visceral fat also typically leads to a decrease in waist circumference. It's a key indicator of improved metabolic health. So the fat doesn't vanish into thin air. It's broken down, used for energy, and the remnants, carbon dioxide and water, are expelled from your body through breathing, sweat, and other excretions. Yes, you literally breathe out a significant portion of the fat you lose. Now let's tackle a persistent myth, spot reduction. Can you do a million crunches and lose fat specifically from your belly? Can you do endless leg lifts and slim down your thighs? Sorry to burst the bubble, but it is simply not possible to target fat loss from specific body areas through exercise alone. Your body doesn't work that way. Fat loss is a systemic process. When your body needs energy and mobilizes fat, it pulls from fat stores throughout your entire body, not just the area you're moving. Doing exercises that target a specific muscle group is fantastic for building muscle in that area. This is called hypertrophy. However, building muscle under a layer of fat does not specifically burn the fat covering that muscle. You'll build a stronger muscle, but the fat on top will only decrease as part of overall body fat loss. So, while those crunches will strengthen your abs, they won't magically melt away the belly fat unless you're in a calorie deficit that causes overall fat loss. This brings us to the exercise debate. 
You might have heard about the fat burning zone. This is typically a lower intensity level of exercise. It's true that during lower intensity exercise, your body burns a higher percentage of calories from fat compared to carbohydrates. However, higher intensity exercise burns more total calories in the same amount of time. Even if a lower percentage of those calories come from fat, the higher total expenditure can mean you burn more total fat overall. Think of it this way. Burning 60% fat at 200 calories per hour, low intensity, is 120 fat calories. Burning 40% fat at 500 calories per hour, higher intensity, is 200 fat calories. More total fat burned at higher intensity, even with a lower percentage. Ultimately, the specific percentage of fat burned during a workout is less critical than the total number of calories you expend. The most effective exercise for fat loss is the one you actually enjoy and can stick with consistently over time. Whether it's walking, running, lifting, dancing or swimming, find something you love. Because here is the absolute non-negotiable bottom line when it comes to fat loss. You must achieve a consistent calorie deficit. This means the number of calories you burn through daily activity and exercise must be greater than the number of calories you consume through food and drink. When you consistently burn more calories than you take in, your body is forced to tap into its stored energy reserves, your fat, to make up the difference. So, while understanding the science of fat mobilization and metabolism is fascinating and empowering, Remember the core principle, create that calorie deficit, stay consistent and trust the process. Your body knows how to perform the great fat disappearing act.